together on this journey through Lent now for uh, about four and a half weeks. Uh, we're getting very close. And on this journey, uh, we're traveling uh, along uh, to a place where, where we are trying to return to God with all of our hearts. We seek to bring our, our whole selves, all of who we are, back to God Back to God from wherever those places might be that we have wandered off. But like a lot of people who are going on a journey, we have to look for signs to give us some direction. Signs that help to point the way where we're going. Now, if you are of a certain age, you, you might remember making road trips along old U.S. highways. And if you were traveling along some of those roads, you might have seen signs that, that were ads for a product called Burma Shave. <laughs> now, Burma Shave signs were, were not these big billboards like you see now. Instead, they were uh, smaller signs set up in a series so that you read the messages one after the other. And they went along and you saw them in little bits at a time that you could read while you were driving past them very fast in a car. One funny example is, does your husband misbehave? Grunt and ramble, rant and rave, shoot the brute, some Burma shave. <laughs> Well, this week's Old Testament reading from Isaiah is a little like that. Uh, it is sort of like another sign along the way. And it's a continuation of the message from last week that we got in 2 Corinthians when Paul was talking about the new creation in Christ. Now, Isaiah talks about the new thing that God is doing. Now, this passage comes to us from a section referred to as Second Isaiah. Although there's just one book of Isaiah in the Bible, most biblical scholars identify it as having three distinct parts. And this part, Second Isaiah, is especially focused on the experience of the people of Israel living in exile, away from their homeland. And these chapters are, are written as a reminder uh, of the, the life-giving resurrection power of God, that it is still at work, even or especially during those darkest times when it seems like all hope has been lost. These words from Isaiah were a reminder to the people of Israel that the God who brought them out of slavery, who delivered them to safety through the Red Sea, would make a way for them out of exile as well. It's in Isaiah chapter 43, starting with verse 16. And as you hear this, listen for those signs of new life that God is bringing. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. Amen. So we take some moments to meditate on this passage. I want to ask you, as God is doing a new thing, how do you typically respond to change? Uh, are you fearful of change? Does it cause excitement in you? Maybe you're hesitant to embrace change, or maybe you're one of those people who jump right in. Or maybe change brings about for you a mourning for what has been 
in the past. But I invite you to consider that now as you take some time to meditate on this. This message that we heard from Isaiah today is sort of an unusual message coming as a reminder to the people of God because it is a message from the prophet to not remember. He says, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. And that's odd because it was... Uh, when so many of the horrible things happened to the people of Israel, they happened because it was when they forgot their history, when they did not remember who they were or what God had done for them. And without being grounded in, in this remembrance, they were easily led astray into the, those ways that do not lead to life. And when they did that, they abandoned those characteristics that made them distinct as God's chosen people, distinct and set apart from the nations uh, around them. However, in this case, Isaiah is calling them to forget because what he wants them to do is leave behind the trauma that they have experienced in the past. He wants them to leave behind the pain and the resentment and the apathy that tended to keep them wrapped up in grave clothes, tied down to the ways of death, rather than the memory that could inspire to help them to move forward to a future with hope. Every single one of us, everyone, at some point experiences some of those dark times those dark times that are hard for us to leave behind. They, they hang on to us, don't they? they? They weigh us down with their burdens. They bring us grief and shame, anger and addiction, disappointment and depression. Those dark times loom large and cast a long shadow over our lives. And that shadow... And sometimes it makes it hard to see the light. It makes it hard to see the light that tells us that resurrection, that new life is possible. So it is in times like these that we must allow something else from our past to rise up instead. A memory that... It's sort of like one of those muscle memories that come back to us. You know, those things that you have done so much and, and so often that even if you haven't done it for a long time, it comes back to you, like riding a bike or shooting a basketball. When we do that, we trust the process, that process that, that leads us to do the thing that brings to life. 
And as Christians, as followers of God, when we do that, we trust the process of moving from death into new life. You know, there's so much that, that we can hold in our hearts in, in the valley of the shadow of death. But there is still, there is always the one who can bring our hearts into the light who can bring us into that place where new life, abundant life, is possible. And where we can see and experience for ourselves that new thing that God is doing that is always springing forth. Before we can embrace it, though, we have to leave behind all of those things that are holding us back. Through, through Isaiah, God is promising that this new thing that is, is springing up, that that it will make gardens out of desert lands, and that even the strangest looking animals like jackals and ostriches will bring honor to God by drinking the living water. This passage is all about change, all about transformation. After all, a river cannot run through a desert without fundamentally changing the environment. And you know what? God's love cannot flow through us without fundamentally changing us. Amen. Isaiah reminds us that God has made us for just this purpose. After all, how can we give praise to the risen Lord, let, let alone rise up ourselves if we are still bogged down in the former things? If we are still so wrapped up in the things of old. St. Paul speaks of this, this idea of leaving behind the old to grasp the new life that God brings in his letter to the church in Philippi. In Philippians 3, starting with the end of verse 4. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss, because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Yes. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank Thanks be to God. I don't know how many of you tend to read some of the books by Malcolm Gladwell. I enjoy them. Uh, in his book, Outliers, he, he focuses on those factors that contribute to the success of people who we tend to think of as the best and the brightest. And one of the most common denominators across a wide variety of fields for people who, who had succeeded was something that he called deliberate practice. He says that anyone can master anything with 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. So that does not mean a couple hours a day of plunking around on a piano. It doesn't mean spending a, a few hours a week in the gym. 
That's not going to, to lead to this. No, this is wholehearted, whole-bodied, focused devotion on this one thing. This one thing. It's the kind of practice that builds that muscle memory that I talked about earlier. And Gladwell says if you're going to get 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, it takes about 10 years of persistent, intentional effort for this kind of practice to begin to echo within your body like that. But once you do it, he says, it feels like coming home. For the people of God, our one thing is resurrection. It is the movement from death into new life. If you were here a few years ago, you might remember that after Easter, I preached a sermon series called Practicing Resurrection. And in that, I referred to Romans 8, where Paul says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Yes. So we can apply this power, this power of new life, to our lives as well. We can apply it to our relationships, to our work, and to the world around us. As a, a church and as individuals a, as well, we should be practicing resurrection all the time. We should always be cooperating with God in making a new thing. Whether that is making ourselves a new thing, or making a new thing out of those situations uh, around us that need transformation. So every time we pray a prayer of confession, we're practicing because we're breaking our hearts and our minds free from that burden of sin that so easily entangles us. Each time we come to the table, we rehearse all over again that movement from death into new life. When we cry out in, in, in prayer for those among us who are hurting and need God's help, trusting that our prayers are heard by a, a God who knows what we need even before we ask, we step out of a grave into that new reality. For every person who comes to the waters of baptism, we recommit ourselves we recommit ourselves to being open to the Spirit who is poured out with the water, the Spirit who hovered over the waters at the beginning of time, bringing God's creative power. All of this, all of these things we do in the life of the church, that's deliberate practice. Something we do over and over and over again until something that is as counterintuitive as the resurrection begins to seem like the most natural thing in the world to us. And on this long and winding journey through the season of Lent, we keep practicing. Because it is our one thing. And it brings us home. Like the old hymn says, the way of the cross leads home. We're getting closer closer to that final push through Holy Week. But it's still going to take some practice if we're going to be able to roll the stone away. You know, the world around us knows all too well about the pain of death, about the injustice of people wrongly accused, the horror of violence inflicted upon the innocent. And as those who are called by Christ's name we can stand up and bear witness that these deaths are not an ending. They are an opening, an opening to rise up into a new life with more hope and more joy than anyone else in our world would ever dare to dream of. Let us pray. O oh God of new beginnings, we praise you not only for the life that you have given us, but for the new life that is ours in Christ. Give us grace, O oh Lord, 
to have faith even where we cannot see so that we can leave behind those things of the past that weigh us down and move forward with great agility to bring your new life and transformation to the world around us. Continue to be at work that even in those places where we walk through the valley of the shadow of death that we may see your light, the light that promises a resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.